Well, good morning. Glad to have you here this morning to worship alongside you as we gather in the name of Jesus as we do uh, every weekend to be reminded of who God is and who we are and what God may be calling us into. Uh, If you are newer to our church family uh, this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you. I hope that you feel a little bit more like family when you leave this morning than when you did when you came. Uh, My name is Brian Roberts. I'm the lead pastor here. And as Pastor Jason was saying, not only is there a gift that we have for you out in the lobby, but I'd like to meet you personally, extend my personal greeting and and gratefulness that you're worshiping alongside us uh, this morning. So if you can, I'll be up here in the front after the service. If you have maybe a little bit of patience with me, I'd love to interact and meet up with you uh, this morning. It should be a good thing. We're starting a brand new series this morning that we're in Lent. And Lent is the weeks leading up to Easter. It's the uh, six Sundays before Easter. It's the 40 days, well, 46 if you count Sundays, but we won't get into all the details like that. But it's the 40 days before Easter as we lead into the Lenten series. And as we've done the last few years, we're going to dive into a book uh, that we're going to try and read together. We're not going to teach through the book like chapter by chapter, but it's a good thing for you to have. We have a a couple copies out in the lobby if you want to grab one. It's called The Way of Grace. Uh, It's by Glandian Carney. You can kindle it for a little bit cheaper if you're an e-reader type person. You can kindle it and you can get it right on your iPad or on your Kindle, read it somehow that way. Or you can pick up a copy out in the lobby or you can grab one on your own. Uh, But it's good for us to kind of read. Like I said, we're not going to be diving into it, you know, chapter by chapter, but it's a good kind of foundation for what we're going to be exploring over these weeks leading up to Easter. Well, also traditionally, the season of Lent is a season that many people uh, engage in a sort of fast one way or another, that they willingly abstain from certain things during the season of Lent. A fast is a way in which we can uh, uh, align our physical bodies with the spiritual life uh, and the spiritual reality of our need for Christ, that we actually purposefully put our bodies in a state of need in one way or another by abstaining from something for the season leading up to Lent. But another thing that people tend to do during Lent is not just to give something up, but to concentrate their mind on something, to set their minds on things above, as Paul tells us in Colossians, to take an idea and to concentrate on that simple idea and to dive into it and kind of unpack it a little bit and kind of let it kind of get into our soul, as it were. And for our church, what we're seeking to do is to look at this concept of grace. We're going to concentrate on the topic and the the subject of grace. And we recognize that eternal life is made possible through grace. And it's through Christ's death and resurrection, His work on the cross. That grace that has been offered to us leads us to eternal life. So it's good for us over these weeks leading up to the celebration of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus to concentrate on what grace means and how we can live more and more fueled by grace in our life. It's good for us to kind of concentrate on that. We're, that's where we're going these weeks before Easter. Let me pray for us. We'll dive into it this morning and get us started. Jesus, we are grateful not only to come and to worship and to hear your scriptures, but to submit ourselves to you. We're grateful that you have offered life eternal, that we can begin to live eternally, even right now. So as we turn our attention to this topic of grace, Help us to understand it well, that we may live in it all the days of our life. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So before I jump into too far uh, into the message this morning, I want to do a little word association, some work that needs to be done on the topic of grace and how we understand grace, how we define grace. So no need to raise your hand or anything else. I'm not going to call on you, but I want you to shout out some words or some phrases, how you might define grace. The word grace. What comes to mind when you think of the word grace? Go for it. Forgiveness. Hold on, I'm not ready yet. The grief happens every time. Someone said it. Faith. Favor. That's an A. It's supposed to be an A. A A-V-O-R. Unmerited. Two T's? No? Dang it. We'll make that a big T. It's a block letter T. It's good. Okay, it's good. What else? Gift. I can spell that one. 
Someone said it with someone over here. Mercy. Unworthy. Unworthy. Good. Loving. Undeserved. Thanks, Maddie. Count on you. A couple more. Whoa. In stereo. Way to go, Bonnie Janice. Like champs. Free. Agape. Peace. What else? Holy. Is that, what, is that what it was? Yeah. Maybe one or two last ones. Jesus. Beautiful. Thanks. Oh, I mean, sorry. Be a UT full. Available. Huh? Good grief. Shareable. Comfort. Good one. Love. Perfect. Great idea. Unconditional. All right. Yo, oh, there you go. Okay. We'll go here. Unconditional. I think that's good. No. Bonnie, I said it's good, so we're not taking it anymore. <laughs> That's what that means. That's what that means. Good grief. i got to keep you in line over here, Bonnie. Good grief. All right, so here's the deal. Uh, oftentimes, we're going to talk about this a lot, this, this series, and it's important for us to get an understanding of grace, and in particular, how we wrestle with it and that kind of stuff. Oftentimes, and I th- I, by the way, I would say that grace is, is, uh, in, encompasses many, if not all, of these things. Uh, and so grace is this large concept. It's, it's not a simple little thing. When you think about grace, you might think, oh, yeah, it's a real simple thing. You may go right to forgiveness, or maybe you go right to unmerited, or maybe you go right to that's a gift, and maybe you zip right into it. And, and those are all true statements. But when you begin to unpack it a little bit, you begin to realize that grace is a lot larger, a, a lot more encompassing than you may immediately be able to say. Grace is a concept that is biblical, and it's a lot to say about our life. Unfortunately, I think sometimes we kind of whittle things down. We try to define things down into real simple things. And for grace, many times when people think of grace, they go right to forgiveness. That grace means forgiveness. And it's almost become synonymous with forgiveness. That, that if we're, we are to have grace, that God gives us grace, God gives us forgiveness. And it's just this kind of immediate synonymous thing with Forgiveness. But I want to tell you that the biblical understanding of grace is more encompassing than just merely forgiveness. It includes forgiveness, but it is larger than that. For the writers of the Scriptures tell us that we are to be sustained by grace. That we are to walk in grace. Paul, when he's talking to some of the people in Athens, he tells them that we are to live and move, to recognize that we live and move and have our being, existence, by grace. Our whole life is to be consumed with grace. So here's what I want to suggest for us as we move into this series, an understanding of biblical grace and how do we understand what it means when we say grace. Grace is God acting on our behalf to do what we cannot do on our own. Let me say that again. Grace is God acting on our behalf to do what we cannot do on our own. So does that encompass forgiveness? Well, of course it does. Because we can't forgive our sin on our own. We're, 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 we, we can't do that. We need someone to do for us what we cannot do on our own. We need God's grace. Is that including the aspect of that's undeserved? Well, of course, because we can't do it 
on our own. We can't earn someone to do something for us that we can't. That's a gift. That's a, it encompasses all of, the, all of this. Biblical understanding of grace is a biblical understanding that God acting on our behalf to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It includes forgiveness. It includes the aspect that it's, a, that it's a gift. It includes all that stuff. It includes taking care of our sin for sure. But it has, it, grace has much to say about forgiveness. A lot to say about forgiveness. But grace is for all of life. Grace is for all of life. In the book that we're kind of diving into, Glandian writes this about grace right at the very beginning of his book. Grace enlarges the capacity of our heart. It allows us to be guided into truth. It gives us courage to accept and reason to celebrate. It opens our eyes to glimpse wonders from God. The foundation for experiencing this unique call is the knowledge that we are saved by grace. We live by grace. Are filled with grace if we are in relationship through Jesus. So when you think about grace, in particular when you think about God's grace, sometimes it's helpful to think of a different word. Sometimes it's helpful to replace the word grace with the word power. With the word power. Grace is God's power to do for us what we cannot do on our own. And just to be helpful for us, sometimes it's good to take some familiar Bible verses, some very familiar things that you may have heard before, and to think about the word grace in that kind of definition. God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. God's power at work in our life. Take Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It is by grace you have been saved, Paul says. It is by God's power at work to do for you what you cannot do on your own that you are saved. Yeah, that's grace. The Apostle Peter writes in his letter, 2 Peter verses, chapter 3, verse 18, where we are to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. See, again, if grace was simply synonymous with forgiveness, if that's all grace had to do with was forgiveness of sin, then grace was not something that we'd be instructed to grow in more, to get more of it, to get more to grow. But we're instructed to grow in grace because we're instructed to grow in the experience of God's power at work in our life to do for us what we cannot do on our own. Grace encompasses forgiveness. Grace has much to say about forgiveness, but it has something to say about all of life as well i want you to keep that in mind to keep that definition the the opening up the encompassing word of grace that we are sustained that we are moved that we are upheld by grace and the invitation for each and every one of us wherever you are in your spiritual life whether you've been following jesus for 30 seconds or for 30 years the invitation for each one of us is to grow in our experience of God's power at work in our life, that it would permeate our very existence, that he would enable us to do what he would do if he were us, where we would routinely and easily, our character would be shaped and be molded into the image of Jesus so that we would routinely and easily do what Christ would do if he were living our life. See, the Christian life is about learning to live moment by moment by grace experiencing the power of God at work in my life to transform my inner character into his image that I may live by grace. And it has much to say about forgiveness, but it has a lot to say about life as well. It's a lot to say about life. In the introduction to the book, Richard Foster writes this, slowly over time and experience, we become the friend of God. And step by step, we grow accustomed to God's presence. We begin entering a with God kind of life. It's the result of living moment by moment, fueled by God's grace, is that we would live an abundant, eternal, joy-filled life that our hearts so desire for. 
And despite all the curveballs that life throws at us, despite all the, the questionable things that we see happening around us, we are a people that are increasingly marked by grace. Marked by the power of God at work in our lives to transform our inner character to be the kind of person that Christ would be if you were living our life. We need grace. And not just for forgiveness. We need it for life. For all of life is sustained by grace. So where do you start with that? How do you do that? How do we begin to live a life that is more permeated by God's power at work in our life? Well, I think Glandian's story, and he shares a bunch of it in his book. I think his story is going to help us along the way these weeks. And he begins to recognize that grace includes the first step of acceptance. Acceptance is the recognition of our inability to manage things on our own. Our inability to be the Christ-like person that we are called to be on our own. Acceptance and grace recognizes that while I need to, when someone does something to me, rather than cursing them i am to bless them that doesn't come naturally to me i need god's grace in order to do that when when someone hurts me or when someone says something nasty to me my my natural inclination is to respond one way but i need god's grace to manifest itself in a way that i would change my character into his image we need to accept the fact that i am incapable of managing that on my own I'm incapable of being Christ-like in my own power where I can just kind of muscle through it, kind of will myself to be Christ-like in the moment. I need to accept God's grace. Glandian is a man you will discover as you start reading his book. He's a man who's been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. His body is physically experiencing such effects of disease and the weakness that he's experiencing it. It's a weakness he can do nothing about. Can do nothing about. And yet it's in the same weakness that he's invited to experience the grace of God again. To experience the grace of God unlike any other time in his life. He's invited to experience it in this time. Glandian struggles to accept his weakness. He struggles to accept the truth of his condition that he's incapable of managing all the the stuff on his own. He, He struggles with that kind of stuff. And and while you and I may not struggle with the same physical weakness that Glandian does, you and I can't manufacture change in our own life either. We like to think we can at some times, but the transformation of our inner character is needed God's grace. So instead of really entering into it, we become masters of appearance. To give the appearance that we are Christ-like in ways in which we really aren't. To, to show forth for everybody else to feed to a feeling as though we are, we've got all things mapped out, that we can respond in a Christ-like way, but our inner character is anything but it. We try to manufacture it. We try to uh, make the appearance of it as if somehow we can manage it on our own. Glandian reminds us that part of grace means accepting the fact that we cannot manage our own inner character transformation on our own. A poignant part of his story, Glandian shares this revelation that God has given him. And he writes this in his book. I think this is profound. He hears God speaking to him and he says, God speaks to him this, Glandian, you don't trust me. You say you do, but you don't. You masquerade and cover up your weakness. You hide because you won't accept what I have allowed. And then Glandian has this, aha moment without realizing it i had been blocking grace by refusing to be humbled as i read this a few weeks ago as i was kind of getting into the book and preparing for things i came across this particular part of the book and i was struck by it personally and i was struck by the question that i found myself asking uh, what ways do i masquerade and cover up my weaknesses In what ways do I pretend that I'm more Christ-like than I really am? In what ways do I have this appearance for everybody to see that I'm more Christ-like than I really am? And how might I be blocking God's grace by refusing to be humbled and accept my position and the road that I need to go? Glandian shares when he finally comes to a point where he's willing to, to... take it and, and to take grips with it. 
to confess his weakness before his church, to let them know what he's been struggling with and the physical issues that go along with the disease. After the service, person after person after person came up to him and they confessed their own weaknesses. One person said, hey, you know, my weakness is addiction. And while I like to think I can handle it and maintain it on, in control, I, I, I can't do it apart from God's grace. Another person came up to him and said, my, my weakness is controlling others. That I, I make sure everyone's doing what I want them to do and I recognize I can't manage that apart from God's grace. And we travel this journey of following Christ. We travel it together. And while you and I have differing weaknesses, the goal is always the same, to discover the faithfulness of God in the midst of our weakness. Now, we can't manufacture Christ-like character in our life. And we first need to come to the spot of accepting the grace that we are needed. So stop the masquerade. To stop the appearing that you are more Christ-like than you really are. And accept the fact that you need grace to respond to the co-worker in a christ-like manner to respond to the person who just said something nasty about you or to respond to that situation that you are so fearful and anxious about you need grace and until we come to the point where we recognize that you can't manufacture it on your own you masquerade around as if you're stronger than you really are then we block the grace of god at work in our life that seeks to desire to permeate every aspect of our life. First step in understanding grace in our life is accepting. Accepting your need, my need. The second step along the way of grace is submission. Submission. Submission is the process of letting go of control to pick up the ways of Christ, to let go of the the outcome, to make sure that I do what I think is needed to be done, that I let go of it. The process of submission is slow. It doesn't happen overnight, but you can't deepen a life with Christ. You can't have a deep life with God without submitting your life to the ways of Jesus. You can't do it. And when you learn to submit, when you learn to let go and to bring that issue, that character need before the throne of Christ, then you may become acutely aware of your lack of trust you might become acutely aware of your self-control tendencies, the ugly side of your self-control, where you want to manage everything and give the appearance as if everything is going great. Or maybe you're coming to this life with God and you say, God, you can have this part of my life. You you can have say over what I do here and what I do here, but when this happens to me, I'm going to respond the way I want to respond. And that you submit maybe a part of your life. Maybe, God, you can have this part of me, but when someone says this, when someone attacks this, my friend, or when someone attacks my kids, or when someone does this, then all gloves are off, and I'm going to go after them like I need to. And I'm going to respond in an unchrist like manner because this part of my life is under my control. But submission doesn't work that way. We're invited to submit all of our life. All of our life under the lordship and the leadership of Jesus. And when we learn to submit all of our life, all of it, then we'll begin to learn what the Apostle Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians when he asked the Lord. Yes, there was an issue in his life that he asked the Lord, pleaded with the Lord to let this go, to take this burden away from him, take it away from him. And the response that God gives the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace at work in your life. You may not need to be in control of it because my grace, my power to do for you what you cannot do on your own, that's sufficient. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? When you realize your own struggle with self-control, and when you come to this point where you realize you need to let it go and you need to to submit it once again. When you realize it, it's real simple. You just simply acknowledge the struggle and pray that the Lord would lead you to deeper trust, that that passage in 2 Corinthians would actually become true, that you would experience that God's grace really is sufficient. So you don't have to retaliate when someone attacks you because God's grace is sufficient for you. He's got you covered. 
that when you get passed over or looked, or looked past or whatever, you don't have to you know, dig your heels in and go after somebody for God's grace is sufficient for you. And you learn to trust that. So growing in grace where God's power at work in our life to do for us what we cannot do on our own, well, it's going to take the steps, the courageous steps of, it, of acceptance, submission. But the third thing I want to say this morning is that's not passive. It's not passive. See, one of the mistakes that is often made when people talk about grace, it's, it's this aspect that it's passive where you just sit back and you don't do anything. You just wait for, for God's grace to just kind of infuel you and just kind of indwell you all by itself. It just kind of happens. Like you're a passive recipient to it. You just sit back and somehow God just kind of infuses you with it. Just kind of inoculates with it. But we experience grace through an interactive relationship with God. We experience grace through this friendship with God, this interactive relationship. You don't manufacture it. You can't make it happen. But we are called to position ourselves in a way which we can receive grace, which we can receive it. Do you see the difference? We can actively position ourselves in a way which we can receive and understand and begin to take steps and walking in grace. We don't passively sit back, wait for God to kind of wave His magic wand over us and He magically make us more Christ-like. We interact in an interactive relationship with Him. We don't manufacture His work on our behalf, but we do position ourselves to receive it. There are three things I want to invite you to do this Lent season to position yourself to live by grace, by the power of God at work in your life to do what you cannot do on your own. And these are simple things. They're not earth-shattering. Just real simple things. But I believe if we do this and we interact in this in these next weeks, we may feel ourselves or see ourselves experiencing more and more of God's grace. We would grow in grace. First suggestion breathe simple enough right i mean you're doing it right now breathe but here's what i want you to do take in a deep breath throughout the day maybe it's in the morning maybe it's as you're getting ready maybe it's when you get in the car maybe it's when you transition from one part of your day to the next but take in a very deep breath and pay attention and alert your senses to the truth that even the breath that you have is god's grace Even the ability to take in that breath is God's grace. To take that in. To alert your senses to it. We've talked about this before in other circumstances, but when you take a couple deep, slow breaths, that reminds you that your very essence is sustained by grace. Your very essence is sustained by grace. So take some time to breathe. Intentionally take deep breaths to be reminded of grace, of your need for grace. Second quick suggestion, fast. Fast. I mentioned this earlier, but fasting is the way you align your physical body with the spiritual reality and our need for Christ. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. These these weeks leading up to Easter, consider fasting of one sort or another to willing, willingly abstain from something until Easter. And every time that desire for whatever you are fasting for, every time that stomach grumbles, every time you find yourself desiring whatever it is that you are fasting from, may it be a reminder to you that you are sustained by grace. That His grace is sufficient for you. And that you are, His, his power is made perfect in your weakness. And just a simple act of fasting from something and allow that to be a reminder to you that you are in need of grace and God's grace is sufficient. So first suggestion, breathe. Second suggestion, fast. Third suggestion, a prayer of relinquishment. Each week we're going to have, as part of our service, at the end of the service, over on the aisles or on the uh, corners of the worship center here, at the kneeling rails, there'll be someone who will pray with you. Create some space for you to come forward and to ask for prayer. Maybe there's an issue which you need Christ-like character to be formed in you. And you recognize that you are unable to manufacture that character on your own. And you need God's grace in that specific situation to manifest Christ-like character 
And so I'm inviting you to come forward and to ask for prayer. And I know some of you are intimidated by that. Some of you are thinking right now, ain't no way. I'm not doing that. Let me just push you through that. Let me invite you gently to push through that intimidation, to come courageously, to accept the aspect that you need grace in a very specific way, to to be the kind of person that would routinely and easily do what Jesus would do if he were you in your situation, that you need Christ-like character in your situation with the person at work or with your siblings or with your children or with your boss or with your parents or someone else. You need Christ-like character to be manifested in your body, in your life, and you are incapable of just willing it to happen, and you need grace. So I'm going to invite you to come every week to come and to bring an area and say, I need Christ-like character to manifest itself here. And I realize it's scary. I realize it's intimidating. But I'm going to invite you anyway. I'm going to invite you anyway. And I'm going to invite you to trust that Christ will meet you here. And you will find as we submit our whole lives, all of our relationships, all of our stuff, friends, I'm sure you will find that God's grace is sufficient for you. And perhaps even as we're talking about this, as we go on here, you may realize that even in these moments, you have not yet yielded your life to the Lordship of Jesus. That you need Christ to indwell your life. That you realize that you haven't yet submitted your life, to his leadership, to him being the king of your life. Perhaps this morning or maybe one of these weeks, you would come forward and ask for prayer and you would ask that someone would walk with you as you make a decision to follow Jesus, that he would be your Lord and Savior. What a great thing to do, to ask for the grace of God to be manifested in your life. Friends, wherever you are in your life with Jesus, my hope and my prayer for you is that you would grow in grace. Grow in grace. Let me pray for us. Jesus, it's because of you that we come and we need you. We recognize our own weaknesses and our own needs for healing and for power. And so we pray that you would step into our lives, lead us, and that we may take the courageous steps of following you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.